thanks everyone for coming out to the October Story Code Forum. Very excited. Uh, this should be fun. Um, we're kind of sporting, we're rocking a new look. It's the, the dimmed lights look. It's for drama, because Sam's presentation is going to kick ass. Um, but uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, if, if this is your first time, um, raise your hand. Cool. Um, Please, uh, afterwards, hang out a bit and, uh, and introduce yourself around. We'd love to say hi. Uh, we program these events on a monthly basis and really invite immersive media and creative technologists to present their work. Um, we're a kind of very maker-focused community, and it's really all about like information sharing. And so we really encourage you, if you have questions, to ask uh, the presenters. And um, we also, today, have a five by five presentation after the primary presentation and the five by fives are basically five slides in five minutes. It's an opportunity for makers in the community to present their work and to ask for help and uh, a chance for the community to maybe join in on a project. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Christina. Hi everyone, um, I'm Christina. I work at KitSplit, which is a marketplace for cameras and creative equipment and we're co-organizing events with StoryCode. Um, and I'm really happy to introduce Sam, who is a friend of mine. Um, we went to ITP together, which is an arts and technology grad program here in the city. And I think it's safe to say that Sam's projects got about like five times more press than any other student at ITP at that time. Um, and, you know, I come from like a more traditional storytelling background, like some of you. And Sam is a programmer who works with a lot of found data, found material, found video online, um, and often edits it programmatically. And I think that it has kind of really interesting implications to storytelling and how we think about stories in this age. Um, he also uh, is one of the people who started something called Useless Press, which is a really interesting publication um, in collaboration with The New Inquiry. And he's also the founder of The Stupid Hackathon, which is a hackathon uh, where you make projects that have no value. And he started that with Amelia, who's here as well. Um, so he's done a lot of really interesting work in the space, and he will tell you more. Cool, welcome, Sam. And uh, we'll kind of, if, if we want to hold the questions till the end, then we can give you guys the mics. Um, well, thanks so much for, for having me tonight. Um, so uh, as, as Christina was saying, I, uh, I'm a research graduate from NYU's Inter Interactive Telecommunications Program, also known as ITP. Um, and I'm currently sticking on for another year there um, as a, a research resident. Um, I'm also uh, an artist. And I kind of like look at the internet as my, my primary medium. Um, so today I'm just going to talk about a few of my, of my past projects, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about my new venture, uh, Useless Press. So my methodology um, with my own work is, uh, is to find some source material online that I find interesting or striking in some way, and then to use various automated procedures to reduce or condense or filter, filter or modify that material and to try to produce an output that amplifies hidden patterns, and in general, just sort of like attempts to reveal something that would otherwise be hidden in my source material. So the kind of like output that I want to have with, with my process is, is like I want to gain a kind of poetic or non-scientific understanding, uh, but kind of with data of what I'm looking at. Um, and I frequently employ tools that I create myself. So uh, the first thing I'm, I'm going to show you is this thing I made called uh, Video Grep, which is a, a super cut generator. So you give it a video file and a search phrase, and it makes a new edit of that video that contains only lines of dialogue with the search phrase you specified. So like, here is one of the first things I, I made with it. I don't have time. I don't have time to worry about how it happened, unless we can get more time. Time is now the currency. I just want to wake up with more time on my hand. I put in some overtime. 25 for the 25th time. Who has time for a girlfriend? Besides, what's the hurry? I don't have time to gamble anymore. I can't take that much time. In real time. Why do you think there are time zones? No one has to die before their time. So that, that, that's the movie In Time. It's like a really bad Justin Timberlake movie. Uh, 
uh, in which uh, we live in a future where time is literally money, and so like most of the dialogue in the movie is just time puns. Um, but so this, this, this tool I made, you can also use it on multiple videos simultaneously. And I started to become really interested in exploring political speech and the way that like political rhetoric is really repetitive and boring. So I mass downloaded all these uh, videos from the White House's uh, YouTube channel. And then I figured out what basically the most common phrase was, which is, which is this. What I can tell you is that they were, they were, that what I can tell what I can tell you is that we are uh, having call what I can tell you is that our position uh, proposition what I can tell you is that it is our what I can tell you is the president uh, has demonstrated in the, what I can tell you is the president supports uh, or what I can tell you is that there's a, to provide to you uh, or, yeah. what I what I can tell you is that that was a subject of report is what I can tell you is that we're concerned about and has what I can tell you is that what I can tell you is when it comes to or what I can tell you is we do support the 31st deadline what I can tell you is uh, the issues with the website I can tell you Roger is what I said you'll notice in, in that in that clip the the um, uh, the cuts were like a little bit strange it's because the video grip uses subtitle tracks so what I do is I, I extract uh, timestamps from subtitle tracks and use those uh, to, to recut the videos uh, and so if the subtitle tracks aren't accurate, um, then some weirdness happens, which, which I actually really like in this case. Um, so this, this was like this really interesting uh, thing for me to kind of like take myself out of the process of creating a video, creating a piece. And I wanted to, um, to kind of like take it even farther and remove myself even more, like automate the process even more. Um, so I uh, made this thing called C-SPAN 5, and it does something very similar. Um, uh, every day it goes um, to C-SPAN, it downloads a video, it uh, finds, uh, it transcribes that video actually, and then it finds top keywords and makes a new cut containing only those keywords. So uh, here's an example. Country, everything, nothing, things, 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 something, something, every student, everything. <laughs> Country, country, think country, 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 vision, thing, something, something, vision, think country, vision, 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 country, country, something, vision, everything, everything, country, vision, divisions, country, vision. Um, and sometimes it makes these like weirdly poetic uh, videos like this. Children, grandchildren, father, 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 children, children, father, children, father, children, father, children, 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 rules, 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 children, grandchildren, father, 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 children, children, father, children, father, children, father, children, 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 rules, rules. Yeah. Um. So what I like about this project is that so every yeah so it's just continually posting these things on 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 Twitter and what I really like about it is that. Um. I don't have to do anything. It just kind of like makes this stuff for me that I can then like later consume. And sometimes there are these like really interesting, sometimes you like learn about what's going on in the day and sometimes you just like learn, you, sometimes it's almost just like if C-SPAN were a poet, that's the poet poem it would write, you know? Um, I've got one more, but I think I'm gonna skip it. Um, so the next, the next project uh, I'm gonna show you is called the Intergovernmental Panel on Capitalism. And uh, I did this as a collaboration with my friend Tiga Brain. Um, so this project makes use of materials that were originally created by the IPCC, or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which in case you aren't aware, is an organization uh, that was created by the United Nations. Uh, it's made up of scientists and policymakers, and their kind of chief activity is that every few years they publish these giant reports on the current state of climate change knowledge. So I was really frustrated around kind of like the, the discourse of the narrative about climate change um, and uh, really like in terms of like what, what I thought the root cause of climate change was. So we, we sort of made this crazy systematic attempt to edit every single thing published by the ICCC uh, and replace the phrase climate change with the phrase capitalism. So that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Capitalism. And we started with those PDF reports that they create. Um, this was a, a sort of like painstaking process because there isn't actually really an easy way to do find and replace all on a PDF. 
Um, so it's, this is actually a program that's just clicking the mouse over and over again for me. Uh, that's, oh yeah, I forgot. Anyway. Um, and, uh, and the output, it, it looks kind of like this. It's like, capitalism over the 21st century is projected to increase displacement of people. Capitalism can indirectly increase risks of violent conflicts in the form of civil war and intergroup violence by amplifying well-documented drivers of these conflicts, such as poverty and economic shock. So the phrases um, are interchangeable and the reports still just kind of like read really well, like no matter what a truth statement is being made. Um, so this is what the reports look like printed out. Um, then we did this on their whole website and I also wrote a program that uses optical character recognition to do fine replacement images. So these are the covers of those reports. Um, I didn't try to make it like subtle or anything, what was going on, you know. Um, but then we did it with video too and using a kind of like fork of that video grep project, we were able to not just like cut up video but do find and replace in video. So we did it on like all hundred videos in their YouTube channel and here's some, here's some highlights. In 1988, the World Meteorological Organization and the United Nations Environment Program had the foresight to recognize that the emerging issue of capitalism would soon rise to the top of the global agenda. By jointly establishing an intergovernmental panel on capitalism, the governing bodies of WMO and UNEP ensured that future decision-making about capitalism would be based on sound science. The poorest people in the world who are going to be most severely uh, hurt by capitalism. What it is saying is that capitalism is a transaction in which some people harm uh, other people. Substantial and wide-ranging impacts of capitalism have occurred across the world. Capitalism is already affecting ecosystems, human health. We have the means to limit capitalism and build a better future. The impacts of capitalism will become progressively more difficult and beyond the scope of our being, of our being able to adapt to them. Action has to be taken now. So this is sort of like a one-line joke that we took to like its most extreme uh, conclusion. But one of the things that I really enjoy about this project is it's like we're creating this whole alternate reality where there is this intergovernmental panel of scientists and policymakers who are actually studying the negative effects of, of capitalism. Um, and uh, it, this was weird because like I haven't shared this with anybody yet publicly, but um, like no one really saw this project as far as I could tell, uh, except for the UN who actually did see it and called my department at NYU and like demanded that we take the project down and said that they had filed a complaint with the State Department, uh, which was crazy. Um, and so we like wrote them back and um, you know, we said that we were glad that they were interested in our work and um, they wrote us back. And I mean, this is like my favorite thing. It's, uh, let me make clear that the IPCC um, does not make any judgment on the possible merits of establishing an intergovernmental panel on capitalism. It's like, thank you, you know. Um, and then we wrote them back, you know, and so like by the end, I mean, it, it, basically like what we're trying to do is get them to work with us to, you know, make the intergovernmental panel on capitalism. And so after we wrote this final email, they like never got back to us. In fact, they were like all on vacation or something and we kept getting autoresponders. And I mean, I just like don't, I don't consider this project finished yet, you know, until, until we hear back from them. Um, but I think that they, might, they may have dropped their, their lawsuit because we annoyed them too much. Um, so, Here's another project. So a lot, of, a lot of my work just kind of starts with um, me just like doing weird internet browsing. And um, uh, this is a project called Three Degrees of Separation from the Military Industrial Prison Data Surveillance State. And uh, this started for me when I was just uh, doing weird searches on LinkedIn, basically. So I was, I searched, I just, I was like, I wonder, you know, what'll happen if you look for the word interrogation? And what you find is actually, there are like a number of people who have been endorsed for the skill of interrogation by their peers on LinkedIn. And this is like this incredible thing to look through because there are these like weird 
like juxtapositions, right? Interrogation, magic, and mystery. Um, or like this guy, counterterrorism, really good at counterterrorism, also good at voiceover. Um, I find this really interesting to go through because it sort of is telling me that these skills, which are obviously like these skills, which are violent skills, are so abstracted away from their real world application to a point where they almost become interchangeable with these kind of like softer, more benign skills. They're all kind of like on the same plane. Um, and that's kind of what LinkedIn is about for me. Um, so I wanted to visualize all the people I was uh, connected to who had skills like these. I made this kind of interactive graph. Um, and of course, this is like, you know, LinkedIn only lets you see people who are within a f two or three degrees of separation from you. So everyone, everyone here is like, I'm connected to in some way. Um, and so on the, you know, we go around, it's like surveillance, enforcement, counterterrorism, interrogation, and something else I can't remember. And there I am in the middle, you know. Um, Yeah, I mean, the thing that's also really funny about this is that the way that I the way that I was scraping the data, it just like was like I I scripted a browser to go through and clicked on different people's profiles on LinkedIn, which means that like they saw that I was looking at their profiles, and then they would start to add me as uh, as connections, which is a really interesting and strange side effect. Um, Okay, I'm gonna show one more of my projects and then I'm gonna move on to Useless Press. So this is again in the, in the genre of like doing weird searches on the internet. Uh, do you guys know about Alibaba? Um, I, made, I made a super cut video to explain it also in case you didn't. Alibaba, Alibaba's earnings, Chinese internet, Amazon, Amazon, Alibaba, Alibaba, China, China, Amazon, Alibaba, China, internet, Chinese internet, 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 internet Chinese growth, price earnings, Alibaba's dollars, growth, Alibaba, price earnings, price dollars, Alibaba, dollars, numbers, Alibaba, Alibaba, growth, price, growth, 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 Alibaba, price, price, for Alibaba, price, Alibaba, price. So, so Alibaba is like, you know, it's referred to as like the Chinese eBay or the Chinese Amazon. And it's just like you can buy anything on it. And so again, I was like, I wonder if you can buy riot gear on Alibaba. And you, and you can. Um, and you can buy it in bulk. So again, I made this kind of like, uh, this sort of visualization that I, and I was, what I was hoping to do is kind of express like the sheer like quantity of, of products for sale. Um, in these different kind of unusual categories. Um, so this is like every single Riot Gear item for sale on Alibaba, sorted by, um, sorted by minimum order quantity and price. Um, the other thing you can buy on Alibaba is, uh, is labor, which is like really insane. Um, so here's like all the labor for sale on Alibaba, right? Um, here's a few selections. I think, I think the way that they phrase these is really interesting because it's sort of just like they don't have the right vocabulary. Even though they're offering labor, they don't have the right vocabulary. So it's like hotel room boy, minimum order of five units for, for $3,000. You know, Vietnam labor services, minimum order of six cubic for, for 60,000, or three cubic, sorry, for $60,000. And there's, a, there's other really weird thing that happens where like, so if you're looking for housemaids, <laughs> if you're looking for housemaids, um, they, have a, they have a recommendation engine, like the same thing, you know, the same way like eBay or Amazon or Netflix does. So if you're looking for housemaids, they also suggest that you buy sexy housemaid uniforms, which is like crazy to think about. Um, so, like I don't even I don't even really have a comment here on this except it's just like so nuts. Um, but for me, what's interesting about this this type of project is that it's it's like the internet is offering us this direct access to an almost unlimited stream of material that institutions produce about themselves either on purpose or kind of by accident. And frequently, the problem is that the material is like almost it's like almost too massive to understand on its own. So my goal is always to find ways to let that material um, kind of speak for itself. Um, okay. 
So now I'm going to talk about a totally different thing, uh, which is this new venture I'm starting uh, or have started with um, with two of my friends, uh, Alix Rule, who I think is here, and uh, and uh, and Adrian Chen, um, and it's called Useless Press. Um, so we're an online publication that produces and publishes uh, useless internet projects. Um, and by useless, I just mean projects that don't really serve an obvious purpose, that kind of like exist for themselves, and that maybe like out, uh, operate outside uh, the logic of fast-paced uh, internet content creation. Um, and one of the things that we try to do is work with people who m might not be able to create things all the way on their own. So people who have ambitious ideas and um, really exciting things that they want to make, but maybe they're not programmers or maybe they're not designers. So we try to fill in the gaps. Um, uh, the first project that we did is called the Data Drive. Uh, and we worked with this, uh, this guy, Daniel Kolitz. Um, and the Data Drive is, it's a reconstruction of Facebook made entirely out of printed and collaged material. Um, so, so basically what Daniel does is this, like he prints out websites and then he, he writes new things, he cuts them up and he pastes it together and scans it back in. Um, and, and what's interesting is that he doesn't know how to use computers at all, basically. Like he doesn't know, know how to use Photoshop. So everything, like, everything is done completely by hand. So what he would do is send me all these giant scan JPEGs, and then I would like, you know, go in and, and Photoshop, like cut them up, and then create this, this web interface. Um, this, yeah, this is like what his room looks like when he's doing this. Um, so like, so you have, you have this Facebook feed, this whole fake Facebook feed, uh, with like a fake messenger, in this case it's Chipotle that's, that's messaging you. Um, and everything you click on is like, leads you to like another fake website. Um, and it's this whole kind of universe. So like this is like one of my favorite pieces here. Uh, study, Generation Z craves oblivion and loves to gamble. Um, but the website is more than just like a satirical set of articles, it's also this kind of fully realized world that you can explore that has its own narrative. Uh, and the premise is that um, Mark Zuckerberg has vanished and stolen all of Facebook's data. And Facebook is now being run by this guy named Buck Calhoun who has set up like a new office for Facebook uh, in a Dunkin' Donuts somewhere outside of Sacramento. And all this stuff is sort of like revealed to you over time as you just like browse your Facebook feed. So as part of the, you know, Facebook has lost all their data and they're currently trying to repopulate it by taking donations uh, from visitors. Um, so you, there's actually like a box on the site where you can enter in, uh, enter in some personal data. Uh, and this was kind of a thing that we like did at the very last minute, but we actually got a tremendous number of submissions to it. Uh, which we then uh, proceeded to auction on eBay. Um, the the winner got the the winner bought it for seventy dollars. It was like pretty great. Um, all right, I'll talk about two more. The next is world leader tips, um, and this is a this is by Brian Clifton. Um, it's a Twitter bot, and what it does is it it tr we track what world leaders do and then try to predict what they're gonna do next, and then we send them alternate recommendations for courses of actions over Twitter. Um, and it looks like this. Uh, dear, I, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna get all these names wrong. Dear Nawaz Sharif of Pakistan, this week we predict that you will acknowledge responsibility to produce global equilibrium. We instead suggest that you deny an action you've taken. Or this, you know, we predict you're gonna make a pessimistic comment. Instead, we think you should grant asylum to someone. Or this, Netanyahu, we think that you will send a note. Instead, we, think we, we suggest that you evacuate. And of course, all of this is, this is completely automated. And the way that we built it is that there's this crazy database of world events called GDELT. And what, that, what it does is it goes through news articles. Oh, shit goes through news articles and analyzes the language and tries to extract event data from them. It then tags that data 
on a score from on a scale from negative 10 to positive 10, negative 10 being very, very bad, positive 10 being very, very good. And so what we end up with is this like this just numeric graph of what different world leaders have done. And once you have a graph like that, uh, you can use machine learning to predict what's going to happen next, which is obviously incredibly inaccurate. And then, and then you can send them something else to do. So the goal of the Twitter bot is to get everyone's score, average score, to 1.0, which on this scale means talk on the phone. So the goal of the Twitter bot is to get everyone talking on the phone. Um, so we like we we were pretty serious about trying to like get this get like world leaders to see this. So like Brian made a brochure which we like mailed to the White House and stuff. And very like a few times world leaders have actually followed us back, which is like really amazing. So not not too long ago, like a few weeks ago, uh, the Saudi government followed us back and and asked if we could. PLZ send more information, which is kind of crazy. Um, so we're not done with this yet, but we're gonna like do a whole like special report for them and, uh, and see if we can kind of engage with them in some way. Um, okay, the last thing I'm gonna talk about is called Pickwick. And um, we just wrapped this project up on Friday, so it's all kind of like very new, and I still ha don't have it like properly uh, documented yet. Um, but I'll just kind of walk you through it. Um, uh, so the backstory is that we wanted to kind of we wanted to explore the this like increasing trend to live broadcast everything, and we thought it would be interesting to try broadcasting something that was just really boring, uh, which is to say novel writing. So, um, so we made this site, which is, it's a mix kind of of like Google Docs, like Twitch TV and Periscope. And then we convinced this novelist named Joshua Cohen to write a serialized novel in real time, uh, which happened last week. So last week, every day between 1 p.m. and 6 p.m., uh, Josh would open up this website and then he would write for five hours uh, straight. Um, and thousands and thousands of anonymous strangers would just like watch him type live. So readers were able to see a video of his face, they were able to watch him type in real time, and they could also chat in a fully anonymous chat room. They could also click on different words that they liked. And he, would, he, he and everyone else would see this in real time. Um, we also asked them to fill out a survey every day. Some of the questions were like kind of practical, some of them were very surreal. Um, like all in all, how do you think the narrator is doing? Or in three sentences or fewer, please describe a dream you had over the past three days. So at the end of the day, we would, we would sort of collect all this data and then we would send it to Josh and he would try to incorporate or to use it in some way to shape the novel. I think, we're, I think we're calling it data-driven literature. Um, so over the course of the week, we had about a million page views, 20,000 chat messages, 127,000 critiques, which are the hearts, um, and about 12,000 responses to our survey questions. Um, and what was like really, what ended up being, I think, the most interesting thing for me about this project was the chat room. Uh, so it's like this really wild mix of like hardcore trolls, uh, like a, a good deal of hate speech, uh, and also some like genuine admiration and 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 real critique. Um, and he started to take lines from the chat, uh, incorporate them into the story, um, and also like use the usernames from the chat room as character names. And it really took on this strange life of its own. Like people were would just like stay on the chat 24 hours a day. Um, at one point, a small group of people decided that they were like rats in Josh's subconscious mind, and they gave, them all, they gave themselves all these like weird rat pun names, like Radimir Putin. Um, and I don't really know what it means. I actually, I actually don't really know what it means yet. Like I'm still sort of processing it. Um, but I think like one thing that was really wild is that, I mean, we, we didn't moderate the chat room at all. 
So, you know, and we, and we didn't track anybody. So you could change your username and you could type anything you wanted and you could spam it. And so the only, what I started to do kind of like towards the end of the week is I gave myself the ability to um, alter the CSS of the web page in real time. So if people were trolling the chat too hard, I would just like do weird things like flip them upside down. Um, and then for like the big finale, I like made music play and like added all these animated GIFs of clapping and stuff. Um, but we'll be publishing a physical version of this book really soon that'll include uh, the text, um, illustrations that also were happening in real time, and just like sort of various other data from the experience. Um, we also got this really weird thing where people thought that we like we're taking it seriously as like a startup. And so this person is like offering to like fly us to San Francisco and we can crash on our couch while we like pitch this to VCs. Um, but it was, it was wild. But yeah, the other thing about it is that like I was writing the website almost in real time as, as Josh was writing the novel. Like we put the whole thing together in about two weeks. But anyway, so that's useless press. Um, and we're always looking for collaborators and interesting new projects. So if you guys have any ideas or just want to chat, please, please get in touch with me. And that's it. Thank you. Cool. Any questions for Sam? Sam, I had one um, about the video grab. So, like, um, what technology are you using to process all those videos? So, what's happening? What's happening is that it's um, it's a Python script. Okay. And uh, and it uses so so it's just it's just really simple stuff just to process the subtitle track or the transcription, extract the timestamps, and then it uses uh, FFmpeg. Yeah. Uh, which is like a command line yep. video editing tool yep. uh, to, to stitch it together. It's actually using another library which uses FFmpeg. But more I've, I've, I'm familiar with FFmpeg and I've heard some pretty painful things about it. It's hard, it can be tricky, but it's like really, once you get the hang of it, it's really good. I'm also making a graphic interface for VideoGrep now, uh -huh. but it's like really prototypey right uh -huh. now. But I want, I want to give it up to other people so they can, they can use it. I right. mean, it's open source already, yeah, but you cool. have to kind of, feel comfortable on the command line. Yep. So it's a higher barrier to entry than I'd like. Cool. Yeah. Got to feel comfortable with the command line. <laughs> I've, heard, I've heard there's w those words before. <laughs> um, any questions? Any other questions for Sam? Yeah, I was wondering, um, th projects like these require you know, participation and engagement from people on the web and I was wondering how you kind of cultivate that. I mean, obviously you're not advertising or anything like that. So is it, are there certain uh, go-to places to build a little momentum for engagement? Cause like this thing didn't have a lot of lead time. This uh, last uh, useless press endeavor didn't have a lot of lead time, but you still got some engagement out of it. Well, one of the, I mean, we, we did do a lot of uh, press outreach for that. So we sent it out a lot and then also uh, Joshua um, did a lot of press outreach also. And he's fair, he's a fairly well-known writer, so I think that helped. Um, but I think, honestly, the reason that we got so much engagement with it is that we didn't try to control it, you know? And I think that, like, it's really risky having an unmoderated chat room, you know? And I think that, um, I think that Josh put himself, like, really on the line for it, you know, and exposed himself to a lot of really weird criticism, a lot of it about the size of his dick and stuff, you know? Um, but I also, th I also think that, you know, like, who is able to, to do that, you know, and put themselves out, out there on the line like that? I mean, it would have been a very different story had it been a woman, a woman writer, I think. And I don't know what would have happened, but I, I imagine that, like, the vitriol in the chat would have been, like, at a whole nother level, you know? So there's an interesting thing to, just to think about um, for me. Any other questions? Can you get that, Christina? Um, how do you get customers from these projects? Can you say that again? How do you get customers from these projects? 
I don't get customers. <laughs> Do you mean like if, well, none of, none of these projects are commercial. So, I mean, that it's, it's, it's um, none of them are intended to be commercial. Size, uh, that person, like the president, or <laughs> um, yeah, I, I do get, I do get, uh, I do get like job job offers sometimes for for certain things. I think the one probably that comes up the most is the video stuff, which is funny because it's an open source tool, so they don't really need to hire me. But you know. <laughs> So two questions. One, let's start with the easier one. When you're making art like this, what's like your approach to like the tools you end up choosing? Like if you don't have, when do you decide to make something versus when do I decide kind of sure. like, should I just use something that exists already? So that's question one. I guess like it depends. It's like really, it just depends. I mean, so for example, for, for Pickwick, there's like already like, there are already like a number of things that did similar things. I mean, you could like replicate that project in a sense just with like YouTube and Google Docs, right? But I wanted to add other functionality and have more control over it. And that's why I decided to make it from scratch. And also it's, it's it just like is more fun to make it from scratch, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think that like the kinds of, those kinds of decisions I think really depend on like what the scope and aim of the project is too, right? So like if it were like, um, you know, like it's never a good idea to reinvent, to reinvent the wheel, right? But if you like kind of have the opportunity to sometimes it can be really fun and rewarding and if you have the time to. I decided I don't wanna ask the second question. You don't wanna ask her? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Sam, um, when you're thinking about an, another project, maybe more along the lines of the found data projects that you were working on, um, you know, you mentioned one part of your process was to just kind of search the internet and see what kind of inspires you, but how do you find these, I mean, is that really how you find these sources of data? Well, I mean, I'm, the thing that I'm like particularly interested in and stuff that like, is stuff that like relates to like, re especially like repressive institutions. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, like, uh, so much of that content is just like staring you right at the face, mm -hmm. you know, right in your face. You just have to, you just have to seek it out like a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's usually what I do is I, is I, I mean, and for like the, I mean, like, but something like the LinkedIn thing was like a total accident, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. It was just like a total, like, I, I should just put the wrong thing into this search bar, mm -hmm. you know? Um, uh, yeah. Cool. Any other questions for Sam? One, one more in the back. This is kind of an abstract question, but do you think the sprawling nature of internet data makes these sort of very simple sort of one-liner responses more natural and as more effective, or do you think in terms of trying to develop maybe deeper approaches as well? Yeah, I mean that's a really good question. I've been I've been trying. I had been trying to make things like super accessible, you know. And I think that's like one of the reasons that I go for like the one liner, the one liner version. Um, but like also like weird things start to happen. Like if you watch, if you watch the full like, you know, five hour long version of that cut where they're all saying capitalism instead of climate change. If you just, just like watch it, like weird things start to happen to, to your head, you know? Like, an, it, like there is like a, the, a depth starts to appear at a certain point, you know? Um, which is kind of like what I, I would hope happens with some of the other ones too. Um, but also like, I think that I'm drawn to the one liner because I just think it's really funny, you know? And I, I want my projects to be funny. Um, because it makes them not, not like less ideological in a way. Awesome. Is there any any other questions? I think we're good. Sam, thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks, guys.